instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will be here. wise counsels, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And tonight we have a very fun Friday night stream discussing Philip K. Dick, the very famous science fiction author, his beliefs, his works, and most interestingly, his, the discussions on his Gnostic spiritual possession. And this is a series of events that really got going in his life after February, March of 1974 and greatly influenced many of his books and works after that period. And so we're going to be uh, diving into Philip K. Dick. This has been a topic that has been discussed uh, uh, in my Telegram group. If you're not in the Telegram group chat, I highly recommend you getting in there. Um, that, sh that link should be in the uh in the video description, but one of the topics I'd bounced around a few months ago is doing a, uh, doing a stream on Philip K. Dick and people thought, Oh yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. So, uh, I never got around to it. And tonight, today I was thinking, Oh man, uh, what, what could I, uh, stream on? And I was like, well, geez, I never did that stream on Philip K. Dick. And so tonight it's going to be really relaxing, not going to be super heady, but we're actually going to be watching some videos, listening to Philip K. Dick discuss his own ideas, discuss again his experience with this sort of Gnostic spirit of Sophia and this sort of feminine, rational mind that he claims intrudes into his own mind. And in fact, um, uh, references to serious, uh, a, ver a, a series of different works that he did where he claims that he actually was instructed on how to finish different books, what to do here. And so very, very interesting. And so for the, some of you guys, and, and before we even get started, ha blessed Lent to everybody, uh, blessed Lent to everybody. Uh, and I hope everybody's having a wonderful uh, enunciation of the Theotokos today. So uh, just wanted to say that real quick, but for some of you younger viewers, you may not be familiar with Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick is one of the most prominent science fiction authors, uh, very important regarding that genre, uh, that literary genre. Um, and he's kind of, uh, wrapped up and, and well, he, he wrote about a lot of different things, mental illness, drug abuse, uh, technocracy, dystopia is a common motif in many of his works. And I think, you know, looking at the state of the world right now, we kind of, in a way, live in a sort of Philip K. Dick novel. I mean, we do exist right now in a sort of dystopia. And, you know, for some of his books, like, um, you know, uh, Electric Sheep, you know, this is about having to kill AI robots that are dominating the planet. And then turns out even the animals are electric. And in a way, as we move into the metaverse, as we move into these sort of false forms of reality, it's kind of like it's all happening again. And so uh, in a way, the dystopia, the technocracy and the fascism that he was so uh, in opposition to it's very present and alive in our own day in 2022. Um, 
And he died, I believe, in 1984, 1982, somewhere in the 1980s, early 1980s. And, and I have his Wikipedia that I was going to pull up here to get started. But uh, just to even open up here, you know, in, in, in a way, we're going to be getting into the sort of weird spiritual influences, possession influences that he himself will talk about. So this isn't going to be me ranting or lecturing for the majority of this stream. We're going to be listening to him in his own words. But uh, in a way, was he prophetic? What, what, what was these sort of Luciferian Gnostic entities, these deep... Were they demons? I mean, obviously, as, as us as Orthodox Christians are highly skeptical of any of this stuff, but um, it's really uh, interesting to think about the state of the world right now. And did Philip K. Dick's work? Did, did people reading science fiction, whether it be our, uh, you know, uh, Ron L. Ron Hubbard, uh, Philip K. Dick, Isaac Asimov? Um, did, did they read and we moved into those realities Did they influence, were they prophetic? I mean, all these gentlemen were into very weird spiritual ideas. Uh, were they influenced? Were they, were they prophetic in the sense that maybe they had access to demon like entities? Who knows? But, um, I think it's very strange to look at our own time, especially with the censorship online, uh, again, the metaverse, every everything that's going on, which in a way is a sort of Gnostic reality, because we're going to be talking a lot about Philip K. Dick's Gnosticism. He was Gnostic. He had a, a, a and later again after this event in 1974 in February and March, where he claims to have been encountered by this rational mind that intruded into his own mind. Um, he got very interested in theology very interested in theology, and he was very Gnostic. And the more he dove into Gnosticism, he kind of believed this to be the case. He was very in favor of the uh, serpent in the uh, Garden of Eden as a liberating force, which is a, a common Gnostic motif that we've talked about in previous streams. And so for those of you, again, who don't know, let's just kind of introduce uh, Philip K. Dick here. Um, so Philip K. Dick, again, uh, was an American science fiction writer. He wrote 44 novels and about 121 short stories. So he was incredibly prolific. And we're going to talk about, uh, I, I have so much video footage to talk uh, to show you guys regarding him discussions, one on all his psychedelic experience. The one that I really want to focus is this experience with with spiritual or mental possession by this entity that he talks about. But uh, I also have a video, a whole video that we're not going to watch all of that. Maybe it'd be a part two for members um, on the inspiration for basically going through his whole portfolio, all his all his works and talking about what the inspiration was, this or that. But uh, Philip K. Dick wrote 121 short stories, 44 novels, most of which appeared in science fiction magazines during his lifetime. His fiction explored a variety of philosophical and social questions such as the nature of reality, perception, human nature, and identity, and commonly featured characters struggling against elements such as alternate realities, illusory environments, mono monopolistic corporations, drug abuse, authoritarian governments, and altered states of consciousness. And so... Ironically, uh, regarding a lot of people, spec, you know, his, his his novels are kind of far out there. Some of you guys may have read. I imagine a lot of people haven't. Um, it uh, he actually only took LSD a few times. He had terrible experiences with psychedelics. So actually, he himself was not considered he himself. Definitely didn't view himself as a psychonaut. Now he struggled with addiction to amphetamines. And this is part of his writing career and, and able to be prolific writer. As we see, he wrote tons and tons of stuff. He did struggle with uh, amphetamine addiction. He was born in Chicago, eventually moved to San Francisco Bay Area with his family at a young age. And he began publishing science fiction stories in 1952 at the age of 23. He found little commercial success until his alternative history novel, The Man in the High Castle, which is a, a novel here. And I'll show you guys before we get going here. The Man in the High Castle is a novel of, again, an alternate reality, a reality in which the, the Axis powers actually defeated the Allies. 
right? And and so Nazi Germany and and um, Imperial Japan, they actually won World War II, and they started divvying up Western Europe and America and all this different stuff. And this is one of his more famous books, The Man in the High Castle. Uh, just to introduce it here, The Man in the High Castle is an alternative history novel written that the Axis powers won World War II. The story occurs in 1962, 15 years after the end of the war in 1947, and depicts the political intrigues between Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany as they rule the partitioned United States. The Grasshopper Lies Heavy is a novel within the novel, which is itself an alternative history to the war in which the Allies defeat the Axis. Dick's themes, thematic inspiration include the alternative history of the American Civil War, Bring the Jubilee uh, by Ward Moore, and the I Ching, a Chinese book of divination that features in the story and the actions of the characters. The Man in the High Castle won the Hugo Award for the Best Novel in 1963. And actually, I have a clip here where he talks about, he said, again, he was influenced by the I Ching, right? Well, interestingly, I have a clip where he talks about casting hexagrams. Again, the, the I, I Ching's a series of hexagrams. This has to do with ancient Chinese divination theories. Again, look into that stuff if you're not familiar. But he claims that he contacted an entity who identified itself as the devil and helped him write this book. And it claimed that he was an ultimate liar and all this different stuff. Really weird and strange. But he claimed he would, he would cast the hexagrams to figure out how that novel was going to go through. And then this is some of the spiritual beliefs and, and practices that I think is going to be really interesting for today's stream. Guys, please smash that like for everybody who's here. And also, if you'd like to support the stream, please do so using the Streamlabs link. I uh, would greatly, greatly appreciate that. So this is one of his, uh, again, very popular books that I have a clip where he'll be discussing the man in the high castle and casting hexagrams inspired by the high Ching to, to, to contact some Luciferian satanic entity who then gave him insight in the finishing of that novel. Very interesting stuff. Um, Again, he followed the science fiction novels such as Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? This is another very impactful book that I'm sure some of you guys actually have read. This is a very popular book, and it inspired the movie Blade Runner. I'm sure some of you guys have seen that movie or even the newer one with Ryan Gosling. Um, that Blade Runner is inspired by this book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It's a dystopian science fiction novel by American writer Philip K. Dick, published in 1968. The novel is set in a post-apocalyptic San Francisco, where Earth's life has been greatly damaged by a nuclear global war, leaving most animal species endangered or extinct. The main plot follows Rick Deckard, a bounty hunter who is tasked with retiring, i.e. killing, six escaped Nexus 6 model androids. While a secondary plot follows John Isidore, a man of subpar IQ who aids the fugitive androids. The book served as a primary basis for the 1982 film The Blade Runner, even though some aspects of the novel were changed and many elements and themes from it were used in the film's 2017 sequel, Blade Runner 2049. And so, uh, again, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but eventually... Uh, the gentleman here, uh, Rick Decker, the bounty hunter tasked with killing these, these machines. Um, you know, here Decker meets the Soviet police contact who turns out to be one of the Nexus six renegades in disguise. And again, what do we talk about the NPCs, right? This is a whole meme within our culture. We talk about these non-playable characters. Very interesting, right? Whether it be these totalitarian ideologies or whether it's fascism or communism or, uh, you know, co corporatism, as we see now, this weird uh, cult following of corporations and getting their sort of morality and ideas from corporations, strange stuff. But interesting, again, just little tidbits here. Now, again, as we'll listen to Philip K. Dick, he certainly didn't have a traditional Christian worldview. He was very Gnostic in his understanding and even his interpretation of Scripture. But... Um, 
This book's really interesting. Again, inspired Blade Runner, um, and, and it ends. Meanwhile, the the three remaining Nexus Six androids, which Deckard is responsible to kill, uh, fugitives plan how to outwit Deckard. The buildings, uh, the buildings only other inhabitant, John. Our Isidore, that low IQ individual, a radioactively damaged and intellectually below average human attempts to befriend them, but is shocked when they callously torture and mutilate a rare spider, he discovers. Oh, it's strange. These androids, these automatons, these sort of NPCs have no feelings. Again, uh, Philip K. Dick trying to highlight what, what exactly makes us human. And, and so... Again, these these androids have no emotions, have no you know spiritual, have no emotional connection to life itself. They all watch a television program which presents definitive evidence that the entire theology of mercenism is a hoax. Deckard enters the building, experiencing strange supernatural premonitions. Uh, of Mercer, notifying him of an ambush. When the androids attack him first, Deckard is legally justified as he shoots all three without testing them beforehand. Isidore is devastated, and Deckard is soon rewarded for a number of Nexus 6 kills in a single day. When Deckard returns home, he finds Iran, his wife, grieving because while he was away, Rachel Rossin stopped by and killed their goat. Deckard travels to an uninhabited, obliterated region in Oregon to reflect. He climbs a hill and is hit by, a falling, uh, by falling rocks when he realizes that this is an experience eerily similar to uh, Mercer's martyrdom. He stumbles abruptly upon what he thinks is a real toad, an animal thought to be extinct. Again, this is in a post-apocalyptic nuclear world, but when he returns home with it, Iran, his wife, discovers it's just electrical. Deckard is crestfallen, and Iran feels guilty about revealing this to him, but when Deckard decides that the electrical animals have lives too, as he goes to sleep, she prepares to care for the electric toad on his behalf. And this is the book, again, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?, are we moving again when we talk about the metaverse, when we talk about these electric electronic realities, um, you know, uh, we're certainly moving in that direction pretty quickly. Again, even though this stuff is, is science fiction, it's far fetched. There's many things that obviously aren't going to be applicable to our current experience. Interesting nonetheless. And, and, and the whole genre of science fiction, again, very interesting so that's another famous book, uh, work by, um, by Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? That's in 1968. He has a famous book, uh, Ubik, which is, you know, in 2005 by Time Magazine was considered one of the 100 greatest English language novels published since 1923. And um, then in 1974 novel, uh, My Tears, uh, flow my tears, the policeman said, won the John, John W. Campbell Memorial Award for the best science fiction novel. Following the years of drug abuse and a series of mystical experience in 1974, and that's where his life really gets interesting, is after 1974, and this is where we're going to listen to him talk about this mind, this possession that, in, that invaded his own mental space and, uh, again, gave him inspiration for many of his works. It's all after 1974. Dick's work engaged more explicitly with the issues of theology, metaphysics, and the nature of reality, as in novels A Scanner Darkly. And, and so, uh, again, A Scanner Darkly, how many of you guys are familiar with that work? Again, very, very famous. A Scanner Darkly is a science fiction novel. Published in 1977, the semi-autobiographical story is set in a dystopian Orange County, California in the then future of June 1994 and includes an extensive portrayal of drug culture and drug use, both recreational and abusive. The novel is one of Dick's best-known works and served as the basis for the 2006 film of the same name directed by Richard Linklater. So uh, some of you guys probably are familiar with um, Scanner Darkly. Very interesting, again, uh, story there as well. Valus. Valus is one that is uh, uh, specifically of importance because Valus is one where 
uh, we get a lot of this interest in the Gnosticism and Christianity by Philip K. Dick. So in 1981, science fiction novel, again, Philip K. Dick is... Uh, is one book of three-part series. Now, he never actually finished the third book. He ended up dying of a stroke. And this is in speculation. Was he a schizophrenic? Uh, Philip K. Dick was very much interested in mental illness. It, it played a serious part in many of his, uh, many of his novels. But um, even him, at times, questioned his own mental sanity, especially when we get into the stories here of, of the sort of Gnostic possession he talked about. And the stories are nuts. You're gonna, you're, you're really gonna love uh, him talking about it. But uh, serious speculation was was Philip K. Dick schizophrenic potentially. It, it may explain why he was able to come up with some of these narratives. Why he sh- he had terrible experiences. I think he took LSD twice. Hated it. Um, uh, who knows? But he ended up dying only at the age of, I think 59. Um, from a stroke that ended up leaving him brain dead, and, and they eventually, I think a few days later, took him off life support. So so a tragic uh, tragic ending to Philip K. Dick. Uh, God rest his soul. Hopefully, uh, you know, God has mercy on him. The title is an acronym for Vast Active Living Intelligent System. And so his experience with this entity, as we'll talk about, that possessed his mind gave him the basis for this vast active living intelligent system because he believed he was interacting with Pista Sophia. Sophia, if you're familiar with like a Gnostic worldview, is the sort of goddess-like figure that gives birth to Yadaboeth, the sort of bastardized demonic god, that the archon that, that then creates this world. He believed in that sort of reality, and he believed that he was in contact with Sophia. And then and, and this was then set forth in his in this novel, Vast Active and Living Intelligence System, Dick's Gnostic Vision of God. Set in California during the 1970s, the book features heavy autobiographical elements and draws inspiration from Dick's own investigations into his unexplained religious experience over the previous decade. In this first book, uh, it is the first book in the complete Valus trilogy novels, followed by The Divine Invasion, which, again, he describes in the video that we'll listen to. He describes this sort of mental possession as a divine invasion of his space. The planned third novel, The Owl in Daylight, obviously you can hear the Moloch references there, had not yet taken definite shape at the time of the author's death. Dick's final novel, The Transmigration of Timothy Archer, builds on similar themes. Dick wrote, The Three, um, the three Do Form a Trilogy, uh, constellating around the basic theme. And so what is this theme? Because I think this is what's going to be most interesting, is listening to his sort of spiritual possession in this, in this book. So the synopsis of Valus is, In March 1974, Horse Lover Fat... The alter personality to Philip K. Dick, again, a lot of this stuff is autobiographical, experiences visions of a pink beam of light that he calls zebra and interprets as a theophany exposing hidden facts about the reality of the universe and a group of others join him in researching these matters. Now, this is part and parcel of an experience he actually had. A woman came to his house. He opened the door. She was apparently a beautiful, dark-headed woman, and she had a Christian necklace necklace on of the sort of, uh, the, you know, ichthys, uh, the sort of fish symbol, Pisces, if you will. And this, the sun glimmered off this gold necklace and he said he saw it as a pink beam. And he began to have these weird experiences where he would see this pink beam. And this then is exactly what he's talking about in this novel here. So this pink beam is is describing his own experience that leads him, again, being mentally possessed by this other entity that we'll hear here in a few. One of the theories is that there is some kind of alien space probe in orbit around Earth and that it is aiding them in their quest. It has also aided the United States in disclosing the Watergate scandal and the resignation of Richard Nixon in August 1974. Kevin turns his friends onto a film called Valus that contains obvious references to revelations identical to those of that horse lover fat has experienced, including what appears to be time dysfunction. So alternate realities, parallel universes, all this stuff is very, very prominent in um, 
in Philip K. Dick's work. <clears throat> The film itself is a fictional account of an alternate universe version of Nixon and his fall, engineered by a satellite called Valus. In seeking the film's makers, Kevin, Phil, Fat, and David, now calling themselves the uh, Rapidian Society, head to an estate owned by a popular musician, Eric Lampton, and his wife, Linda. They decide the goal that they have been led to. Uh, toward is Sophia Lampton, who is two years old and the Messiah or the incarnation of Holy Wisdom, Pista Sophia. So we see the Gnostic elements right here in Valus. Of course, we see the inversion of Christ becoming a female. We see the inversion of Holy Wisdom not being the Holy Spirit, not being the paraclete, but being a female child. Uh, again, the incarnation of Pistis Sophia, anticipated by some variants of Gnostic Christianity. In addition to hearing Phil's schizophrenic personality split, he tells them that their conclusions about Valus... Uh, and reality are correct, and, and more importantly, that we should worship not gods, but humanity. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? And this is this interesting part, that even though uh, there's some things that we're going to listen to Philip K. Dick say, some of it we may agree with. Again, the, the communism, the fascism, the corporatism, he was very against all, all, he was very fearful of a lot of different forms of authoritarianism and believe that they were sort of imminent on, in our society, which again, look around, they're here, uh, big tech, uh, globalism, uh, our own government. Uh, but at the same time, his Gnosticism, he has very strange interpretations of scripture. Um, and then here, we are not supposed to worship gods, but humanity. This is part of these Gnostic messages he was getting from this rational mind. And again, very Luciferian. Very, very uh, contemporary in the new age and in, in, in the pleasure seeking uh, demeanor of the world now. Right. Wanting us to worship ourselves. Very Luciferian. Um, so obviously something that we definitely would disagree with. She dies two days later. Uh, the little baby, Sophia, to a laser accident caused by Brent Minnie, underrated or undeterred fat, who was now. Uh, resurge goes on a global search for the next incarnation of Sophia. So we see then the concept of reincarnation, the transmigration of souls. Dick also offers a rationalist explanation for this apparent theophany, acknowledging that it might have been uh, visual and auditory hallucinations from either schizophrenia or drug addiction. Again, and he, he recognizes he did have a problem with amphetamines and says, maybe I am schizophrenic. Maybe that's what all this stuff is. So, um, then you have the transmigration of Timothy Archer, another very famous book by Timothy, uh, by Timothy Leary, by Philip K. Dick. And the transmigration is about, so, uh, is his final work. This is the last work that he publishes before he dies. This book was published shortly after his death in March, 1982, Although it was written the previous year, the novel draws on autobiographical details of Dick's friendship with controversial Episcopal Bishop James Pike, on whom the title character is closely based. It continues Dick's investigation into the religious and philosophical themes of Valus. Now, who is James Pike? Some of you guys may have never heard of him. It's actually... This is a very this is an important figure to know. Uh, James Pike was an Episcopal bishop, uh, very prominent in the 1960s as a sort of leftist. As his Wikipedia says, he was uh, he was an early proponent of the ordination of women, uh, racial desegregation in the mainline churches. Um, he was very open to to explore spiritualism and psychic phenomenon in an effort to contact his deceased son. So he was also very much, I, remember, I know from people in the psychonaut community that James Pike was very interested in, in some of the psychedelic research going on at the time. So um, um, James Pike has a very strange death. Again, there's a lot of people who are upset with James Pike and how his sort of leftism, his progressive ideology, uh, he was a very prominent figure. Uh, in American culture at the time. He was one of the early figures that was on television. 
But he died uh, in very strange terms. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, he he and and his uh, wife. So in 1969, uh, Pike and Diane traveled to Israel to do research on a proposed book on the historical Jesus Christ wanting to have a feeling of the landscape where Jesus went into the wilderness uh, to fast and meditate for 40 days. On September 2nd, they drove into the Judean desert outside of Jerusalem, planning to drive to Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls had been discovered. Why? Because they were very interested in some of this Gnosticism stuff. Now, remember, the De- you know the Nag Hammadi, uh, I believe that's, what, 1948, that all that stuff gets uh, gets brought together. So a lot of that Gnostic, Gnostic, Gnostic text, it wasn't until uh, the, you know, the 50s where people were aware of this. Pike was certainly interested in many of this stuff. Um, only buying two Cokes along the way and taking no water or guide with them. They end up going into the desert. Long story short, they get lost. He gets lost. Uh, Eventually, the woman that he's with is able to uh, find her way back. He, on the other hand, uh, is out in the out in the desert for five days, and he's his body is later found dead on the seventh of September, nineteen sixty nine, on a south route his wife had taken. And he had found a large pool of water in a shaded area in the canyon bed, but instead of remaining there, continued to follow what he thought was his wife's route, leaving a trail of a map, undershort, sunglasses, and her contact lenses to indicate the path he had taken. Pike was apparently climbing a steep canyon wall in the Wadi uh, Mashash when he slipped and fell more than 60 feet to his death. The date of death in the burial certificate is sometime uh, potentially September 2nd. Some sources cite it was between September 3rd and 7th. And so very interesting that James Pike then is the basis for the uh, for Timothy Archer and the transmigration of Timothy Archer. Again, another very famous and prominent work by Philip K. Dick, a collection of his speculative nonfiction work uh, writing on these themes was published posthumously in the exegesis of Philip K. Dick. And this is the exegesis of Philip K. Dick, a nonfiction book containing the published uh, selections of a journal kept by the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, in which he documented and explored his religious and visionary experiences. Dick's wealth of knowledge on the subjects of philosophy, religion, and science inform his work throughout. And so here's the background on the journals. Uh, Dick stated that the journal, after his visionary experiences in March, February and March of 1974, which he called the 2374, these visions began shortly after da- Dick had uh, two impacted wisdom teeth removed. When a delivery person from the pharmacy brought his pain medication, he noticed the ichthys, again, that, that uh, fish symbol that, that's used in Christianity by early Christians, necklace she wore and asked her what it meant. She responded that it was a symbol used by the early Christians. And in that moment, Dick's religious experiences began. And that instant, as I started, as I stared at the gleaming fish sign and heard her words, I suddenly experienced what I later learned is called an amnesis, a Greek word meaning literary loss of forgetfulness. I remembered who I was and where I was. And in an instant, And in the twinkling of an eye, it all came back to me. And not only could I remember, but I could see it. The girl was a secret Christian, and so was I. We lived in fear of detection by the Romans. We had to communicate with cryptic signs. She had just told me all this, and it was true. For a short time, as... uh, As hard as it is to believe to or explain, I saw fading into view the black prison-like contours of hateful Rome. But of much more importance, I remembered Jesus, who had just recently been with us and had gone temporarily away and would very soon return. My emotion was one of joy. We were secretly preparing to welcome him back. It would not be long, and the Romans did not know. They thought he was dead, forever dead. That was the great secret, our joyous knowledge. Despite all appearances, Christ was going to return, and our delight and anticipation were boundless. In the following weeks, Dick experienced further visions, including a hallucinatory slideshow of abstract patterns and an information-rich beam of pink light. 
In the exegesis, he theorized as to the origins and the meaning of these experiences, frequently concluding that they were religious in nature. The being that originated the experiences is referred to by several names, including Zebra, God, again, Valus, vast, active, living, intelligent system. From 1974 until his death in 1982, Dick wrote the exegesis by hand in late night writing sessions, sometimes composing as many as 150 pages in a set. In total, it consists of approximately 8,000 pages of notes, only a small portion of which have been published. Besides the exegesis, Dick described his visions and faith in numerous other works, including Valus, Radio Free, uh, Albemuth, The Divine Invasion, The Transmigration of Timothy Archer, One Brief Passage in A Scanner Darkly, and The Uncompleted The Owl in Daylight as well as many essays and personal letters in pursuit of Valus, selections from the exegesis was published in 1991. So again, very, very interesting stuff there, again, re regarding his sort of Christianity and his, his religious experience. Dick's posthumous influence has been widespread, extending beyond literary circles into Hollywood filmmaking. Popular films based on his works include Blade Runner, Total Recall, Minority Report, A Scanner Darkly, Adjustment Bureau, and Radio Free uh, Ab Abelmuth. Beginning in 2015, Amazon produced the multi-season television adaption The Man in the High Castle based on Dick's 1962 novel. And in 2017, Channel 4 began producing an ongoing anthology series, Electric Dreams, based on various Dick's stories. And so um, we're, we're getting ready to now get into uh, his words and, and listen to him talk about these wild experiences that he had. Um so, uh, again, talking about some of these, uh, let's see. Well, that's going that basically just kind of confirms what we were talking about that throughout February and March of 2000, uh, Dick experienced a series of hallucinations. Um, aside from the pink beam, he described the initial hallucinations as geometric patterns and, occa and occasionally brief pictures of Jesus in ancient Rome as the hallucinations increased in duration and frequency, Dick claimed he began to live two parallel lives, one as himself, Philip K. Dick, and the other as Thomas, a Christian persecuted by Romans in the first century A.D. He referred to the transcendentally rational mind as zebra, God, and Valus. So he believed that that's part of these Gnostic experiences, that he saw himself in part of these, na these narratives of reincarnation, that he believed that all history was happening at the same time. Again, there was a breakdown in time. This is a common motif throughout many of his books. He was both Thomas a Christian, uh, early Christian at the time of Jesus being persecuted by the ancient Roman Empire. And he was also Philip K. Dick in the mid-20th century, science fiction writer, writing many of these books. So again, very strange, very interesting stuff. So this is what we are, again, about to dive into right now, just to do a few quick housekeeping. Guys, please smash that like if you're here. Smash that like. If you enjoy what I'm doing here at Church of the Eternal Logos and you would like to support, the best way you can support is to become a website member. Please do so with the following link. It's $5 a month and you have access to exclusive video content of which I'm going to be making a new uh, members only video tomorrow on the Hashishians, the assassins, the group, the, the Muslim group. That's the basis for the video game Assassin's Creed. That is actually based on a real historical group. I'll be talking about all that in a members only video tomorrow. So if you would like to have access to a lot of members only exclusive content, please go to the website and sign up for $5. Also, if anybody would like to set up a one-on-one -on -one session to talk about anything, philosophy, theology, mysticism, goal setting, fitness, you can do so with the following link and sign up for a one-on-one -on -one session. I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, so, uh, guys, please smash those likes. And if anybody would like to support during this stream, please use the Streamlabs link. I would be greatly appreciative. Uh, if you prefer to use YouTube, feel free to use YouTube. We'll get to all the 
Um, we'll get to all the uh, super chats at the end. So now, without further ado, guys, let's dive into these incredible narratives and stories of Philip K. Dick. We're going to start again with him, his discussion of the invasion of this Valus, this Gnostic mind, Pistis Sophia, right? And um, let me pull this up. Now, what you're getting ready to watch is actually uh, videos that I had constructed on my old YouTube channel. So you're going to see uh, descriptions of, um, uh, you know, fractal universe and all this. This is what my old YouTube channel looked like. Again, now all these videos have been privated, but because it's my YouTube channel and I spent a lot of time making them and finding these audios, we're going to listen to them. And so I have, again, I don't know if I, we're going to be able to listen to all of it. I have, um, I have this one on his possession, which we're going to listen to the whole thing. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. I also have one on um, his drug use, and I have another one as him talking about sort of casting the hexagrams of the I Ching to finish that book, The Man in the High Castle, and how he contacted an entity that claimed to be the devil and said he's the father of lies and all this different stuff. So I want to definitely get into him contacting the devil if you guys want to listen to the psychedelic one, let me know in the comment section. Um, I may just make that for uh, members only. So anyways, without further ado, guys, let's get into this discussion of Philip K. Dick talking about the rational mind that invaded his own. And this is the basis of his sort of Gnostic spiritual possession. And uh, I'll probably, I may stop once in a while to, to add in a few things, but you're definitely going to enjoy this. It's definitely an interesting listen. So here we go. My outlook is based on, not on faith, but on an actual, that, the actual encounter that I had in 74 with a mysterious, powerful, rational mind, which was unfathomable to me as to what it was, to what it called itself, it seemed to resemble Ubik to in many respects. Ubik, the entity that I had written about in the novel by the title. When you say an encounter, was, was this um, a, a sort of hallucination or a vision or something? It was an invasion of my mind by a transcendently rational mind. It was almost as if I had been insane all my life, and suddenly I had become sane. Now, I've actually thought of that as, as a possibility, that I, that I actually have been psychotic until 1974, from 1928 when I was born until, 19, until March of 1974. But I don't think that's the case. I mean, I may have been somewhat whacked out, you know, and somewhat eccentric for years and years and years. But I wasn't all that crazy because I'd been given Rorschach tests and so on. This was a rational mind that was not a human rational mind. It was it was more like an artificial intelligence. Now I don't pretend to know what it was. On Thursdays and Saturdays I think it was God. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays I think that it was extraterrestrials. Sometimes I think it's, it was the Soviet Union, the Academy of Sciences was trying out their, their psych, psychotronic microwave telepathic trends. I thought about that. I tried different theories, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I tried every theory. I thought of the Rosicrucians. I thought of the Russians. <laughs> I thought of extraterrestrials. I thought of God. I thought of Christ. Was this something you heard then? Or, or was it more than that? Kind of well, it. it, it <laughs> the experience. Uh, it um, it invaded my mind and assumed control of my motor centers and did my acting and thinking for me. But you had your own consciousness there as well. Yeah, but I was a spectator to it. Oh. And it first of all, it set about healing me physically. And my little boy, my little four-year-old boy, had a birth undiagnosed birth defect. And this this mind, which uh, whose identity was totally obscure. To me, I even thought it might have been Elijah, it might have been the Holy Spirit. I, I thought of everything. I, I, all I can say is I don't know, was that it was equipped with, with tremendous technical knowledge, engineering knowledge, medical knowledge, cosmo, cosmological knowledge, philosophical knowledge, 
Um, the first thing that it informed me was to be very wary of heavy metals. And I've even thought that it was one of the great Illuminati of history, one of the great Rosicrucians, like it might have been par Paracelsus. I thought, I thought for a long time that it might have been Paracelsus. I thought it might be a previous incarnation of myself that had broken through. It had memories, it had memories dating back over 2,000 years. It spoke Greek, it spoke Hebrew, it spoke Sanskrit. There wasn't anything that it didn't seem to know. It uh, immediately set about putting my affairs in order. It fired my agent. It fired my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was very practical. It decided that the, the apartment had not been vacuumed adequately and not recently enough. It decided that I should stop drinking wine entirely because uh, of the sediment. And it turned out I had uh, abundance of uric acid in my system and switched me to beer. Um, it made elementary mistakes. It kept calling the dog he and the cat she, which annoyed my wife since I knew and she knew that the dog was a female and the cat was a male. It kept, re kept calling her ma'am. Uh, and it would lapse into, into what turned out to be Koine Greek uh, when it would fall into a, co a contemplative state. Uh, she recognized it as Koine Greek because she'd taken some Attic Greek in, in, uh, in school. I didn't even recognize it as a language. I felt they were just, it was just nonsense. Uh, it was very intelligent and had a firm and shrewd grasp of business matters. It remarked into my typewriter's <laughs> margin. Um, I even thought it might have been the soul of, of my friend Jim Pike come back from the dead. And I'm, I don't exclude the possibility either, uh, Charles. I'm not willing to exclude the possibility that Jim Pike came back to me as his son Jimmy came back to him because it had a tremendous interest in early Christian theology and in Zoroastrianism, which Jim Pike had confessed to me once he believed was probably the true religion. He was very versed in Zoroastrianism and knew a great deal about the Essenes and the therapeutic. How did your wife perceive all this? Did you tell her what was going on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we discussed it. Um, she was impressed by the fact that because of the tremendous pressure that it put on on people in my business that I made quite a lot of money very rapidly. We began to get checks in for thousands of dollars, money that was owed me, that this mind was conscious existed in New York and had never been coughed up. Uh, it also wrote a letter to the, Roman, to the Roman Catholic Church informing the Roman Catholic Church that my writing contained uh, allusions to the New Testament which were to edify the Roman Catholic Church that a miracle had occurred and that Uh, it was very busy and active. Uh, does this interest you? I could have not. Okay. Uh, it had one overweening concern. This was in uh, March of 1974. It informed me that a group of conspirators had murdered the Kennedys, Dr. King, and Bishop Pike. That it, the mind, that had taken me over, had seen the conspirators. The mind then graphically represented itself as the Kumeyan civil. What's the what? The civil of Kumeyan. Oh, I, I'm, my logical knowledge is not very... Well, the Kumeyan civil was the Roman equivalent of the Delphic civil of Greece. It, uh, the command civil advised the Roman Republic when it was in danger. She had the so-called Sibylline books, which were consulted by the uh, Roman Republic. Uh, she, well, now I've let it out of the bag, haven't I? I said she, it was female. She was female. She had the Sibylline books. She showed me the Sibylline books. She said the Republic was in danger. She meant the American Republic. She said that once again the Empire threatened to take over. 
she was there to see that the empire was destroyed. I shouldn't be saying this. This is really stupid of me, Charles. I shouldn't be talking I'll about it. I'll cut out anything that you want. No, to I don't approve of that. I mean, if I'm indiscreet enough to say it, I don't necessarily want to sense, censor it. Well, wait a minute. I didn't see it that way. I see it as uh, sometimes you need to think carefully as to what you want to make public and what you don't. And you can't think carefully at the same time that you're talking. Well, that's true. That's true. So I, you know. Well, okay, most of it's in balance. She said that the oscillation between the Republic and the Empire was a constant in history. She caused me to see periods in history in which the Empire had been defeated. It took me five years to identify one of those periods. It turned out to be the War of the Spanish Lowlands. It turned out to be the beginning of the 17th century in which the, the Dutch cities broke off from the Holy Roman Empire. She said that that was the situation now in the United States in 74, that the Republic was turning into an empire. And she said, and they shall be destroyed, for they are murderers. Um, she then dictated a series of letters to Charles Wiggins. Charles Wiggins was on the House Judiciary Committee sitting in on the decision as to whether to impeach President Nixon. She said to inform she would dictate the letters. She dictated a series of letters to Congressman Wiggins. They dealt with constitutional law. I didn't understand the letters. Because they dealt with constitutional law and nothing about constitutional law. Later I found out that, that Congressman Wiggins is, is such an authority on constitutional law that he was uh, suggested as a possibility for the Supreme Court. He came from Fullerton, which is where I was living. And it was his practice to read every letter that came from Fullerton and to answer it. She revealed to me that she had moved me to Fullerton from Canada so that I could write to Charles Wiggins on the Judiciary Committee while they were sitting in judgment on whether they should vote out a bill of impeachment on President Nixon. She dictated a series of letters informing Congressman Wiggins that he had no loyalty to the President of the United States because the President had violated his oath of office, which was that he would uphold the Constitution of the United States. He had failed to do so. Charles Wiggins did not owe the president any loyalty, citing historical examples. Congressman Wiggins answered each letter in detail. And then she sent the final letter. The letter contained the information of the Nixon transcripts with forgeries. They did not correspond to the next to the tapes. And if the tapes were released, it would show that the transcripts were forgeries. That letter she sent to the um, Wall Street Journal, which had published an editorial saying that the, for, the uh, transcripts showed that Nixon was innocent and that we should believe him when he said that they corresponded to the tapes. She stated that the transcripts were self-serving, were not evidentiary, and that the tapes would show that the forgeries, that the transcripts were forgeries. And at that point, she wound down. But by that time, she had gotten me to the doctor. She had had me diagnosed, found a number of physical ailments that I had. My little boy had gone in for surgery and had his birth defect repaired, which was a life-threatening birth defect. You could have killed him at any time. She had everything but paper the wall for the apartment. Um, she told me about the article that would be coming out in Rolling Stone by Paul Williams. She told me that it would change my life. What was it? The article Rolling Stone by Paul Williams about me. Oh, that one. Yeah, I said she told me that would be coming. Out. She said your friend Paul. She showed me the article. Yeah. Said your friend Paul will be doing an article about your troubles in Marin County. Mm -hmm. yeah, at that point, Paul hadn't said to me anything about it. She also said that she would stay on as my tutelary spirit. I had to look up tutelary in my life. Yes. She had the unfortunate habit of lapsing into Greek. 
And then, having healed me, calmed me, she presented me with the beatific vision. She showed me a garden of such beauty that I could not believe it existed. And I walked around in it. I was actually in it. She transformed the landscape for me. Palm trees, beauty of indescribable beauty, just indescribable beauty. And she said, when you get old and are dying, I will come back for you and take you there. But she said, I will not come back until then. She said, I got my, she says, I have to leave now. So, I don't know who she was. She appeared as Aphrodite at one point. Uh, <clears throat> at one time, I said, uh, who are you? Who are you? Tell me who you are, for God's sake. Tell me who you are. And she said, think of me as Diana. <laughs> she said, the She said, for me, everything is permitted. She, Diana turned, looked up Diana. She turns out she was the Roman patron, God, patroness of slaves. She was loved by the lower class. Uh, in addition to all these things, she solved a problem facing me, which was of such gravity that it probably was the greatest crisis of my life. Um, at that point, she described herself as, as the Holy Wisdom and applied the powers of Holy Wisdom to the problem. But at, at another time, she described herself as the spirit of Erasmus. Um, and finally she said that she was essentially playing a game, that she loved to play games, and that none of the things she described about herself or her identity were, were correct, that, that, she, that I would never know who she was. That she, 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 I heard the beautiful bells in the distance, and, and whenever, the most beautiful bell. But she finally said that, she, that I would never know who she was. You know, a lot of people, if anyone heard this transcript, which uh, as far as I'm concerned, they won't because I regard this as a very special conversation. Um, they would think you were putting me on. I can hear Norman spin around. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I've, I've taken notes on this, and I have almost 500,000 words of notes that I've taken. Um, when, when, when Ballas comes out, see, probably by the time your interview comes out, Ballas will have come out. And, well, what's the publication? Uh, they haven't set a date. They're trying to get a hardcover of Songlin's hardcover edition. Well, this book is vaguely scheduled for May of 17, of, of 18. So, uh, just for those watching, I mean, this is a obvious, I believe, case of preless, clearly. Um, and so, you know, let me know what you guys think this is. I, I definitely think it's a sort of a demonic, uh, some type of preless spiritual experience with this entity. It's very interesting that it claims to be timeless. It claims to be Diana. It claim it speaks in uh, Sanskrit and Greek and Hebrew. It knows all this stuff about Gnostic theology and supports Gnosticism. So uh, very interesting. And then, of course, this is Valus, the book that I was talking about in 1974 that he wrote that is really based on these experiences. So continuing on here. Don't forget to smash that like, guys. And if you appreciate this stream, uh, feel free to throw in a super chat using the Streamlabs link. Well, it, 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 it's hard for me to because Banner can publish real fast. Uh, 
I wrote a lot of it up in balance. Yeah. But is Venice then a novel or, or a mixture? It's a mixture of autobiography, fiction, mm -hmm. and dramatic devices from the uh, modern theater. With a current doll and a fairy. I did enough to read it. I don't pretend to know who she was. Uh, she said conflicting things. Uh, I have. I spend between four and eight hours a day doing research in, in history to find where anybody's had an experience like this. I can't find an example. Uh, I just keep seeing you as, as being uh, a natural focus for some strange new religions. She, uh, at one point, I was convinced that I was dealing with a computer. I said, would you tell me where you I said, all right, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll make the deal. Will you tell me where you are? She said, I'm in the Portuguese states of America. I said, there are no Portuguese states of America. <laughs> but she she was able to solve intricate problems that I was facing. She, she loved puzzles. She still wants puzzles. She loves puzzles. And she, she was fascinated by a puzzle uh, crisis for me. It was a serious crisis. It was a puzzle involving my anti-war activities and my political affiliations. Uh, she saw in it, I think, a chance to solve a puzzle that was a Chinese finger trap. The harder you tried to solve it, the mm. further away you got. And she saw an opportunity to. This. I, I'm, I'm really convinced that her love of puzzles was was just too much. She couldn't read this. I'm reminded suddenly of that that. Um, so, well, a series of events that we can build you where Mr. Lincoln keeps sort of puzzles. Yeah. About the trivial places. So. so, I had to write a book about this, and I just construed her as the, as a rational mind mm -hmm. breaking into mm -hmm. the irrational universe. So, I call her vast active living intelligence, mm -hmm. which is a description, a simple description. Vast, active, living, intelligent. She's an organized system. Mm. And uh, do you recognize the possibility, however remote, that that you could have, in some way, been talking to yourself? That in, in some way you could have known everything that she knew. Yes, it could have been a dialogue between the two hemispheres of my brain, as we find in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. There was my right hemisphere. It could have been a, a, a second uh, ecosystem, a second self system in my head. But you prefer not to believe it? Um, this was suggested to me by at least one person. Mm -hmm. And certainly Scanner, which had already been written, yes. I had already written Scanner, although I hadn't published it, suggests that I have two cycles. Two psyches in my head, mm -hmm. one each, each hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And the right hemisphere personality broke through, mm -hmm. and it's the anima, I know the term, my anima, anima. Yeah. Yeah. But there's only one thing that, that, that there's one thing that, that happened which, which, when I think that, when, when mm -hmm. I think to myself, I have another personality, and that was it, is that um, she interfered with a sequence of causal, of causal events. Mm -hmm. My environment. Mm -hmm. She was actually present as an extra, or appeared present. Appeared present. Now, she may not have been. It may have been a projection uh, from my own mind onto, onto my reality, onto my environment. But I mean, the cases that I've read of, of multiple personalities. Well, I, I think it's a good possibility. The, the only thing is that she was armed with. Ferocious knowledge. That, that, of course, is, is the, the part which is so fascinating. She, she, and she was, I mean, she was so shrewd, and she continued to, she had, she had first spoken to me in high school uh, during a physics test in the 11th grade. I wasn't able to solve any of the, of the 10 questions eight dealt with, or based on Archimedes' principle. 
And I didn't know the principal, so I couldn't solve the eight question with the two. And all of a sudden, uh, her voice cut in, and she said, she explained our, she, she explained our main principles. And she, she explained the principle in theory. And then she showed the application, each one of the eight questions. And I said, well, now I'll test this out and see if there's anything to this by, by examining the grade that I got. And of the ten questions, one was wrong. And it was one of the first two, yeah. which I had done. And all eight that she had done were correct. I got an A on the test and an A on the are, are you now saying then that this is a voice which has broken through to you over the years? Just two times before oh, then, and once in the 60s. And also she had put a great deal of material in my novel, which she was very proud of. She was not reticent about that. <laughs> she drew my attention to material. She had put Ubik, Flow My Tears, Faith of Our Fathers. You know, there is nothing that I like better than to have my worldview uh, shaken up. She said to me, the last thing she said to me was last week. She said to me, she, for the first time she used the word I, speaking of herself, she said, I make moves which you do not understand. And I knew you know, that, that she would always elude me, and that she knew she would always elude me, and she knew I would always try to understand it. Did she tell you anything about talking about this? She told me two things in order to tell. Oh. <laughs> so I, I inferred from that that I was, it was all right to tell the rest. Oh. No, I just wondered if she sort of said, when someone turns up with a tape recorder, <laughs> do this. She told me two things. And I, as I say, I just infer it was all right. But I'm, I'm quite reticent mm. about this. I do not. I've talked to my priest about it. Mm. And I've talked to a couple of my close friends, and of course my ex-wife knows about it. And um, several people that I correspond with, I, I've discussed with. Tried to discuss it with Ursula Le Guin, and she just wrote and said, I think you're crazy. And sent back the, 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 the material. I'm, I'm sending some material. She mailed it back and said, I think you're crazy. So, that, that of course, you know, I didn't tend yeah. to discuss it very much, but yeah. uh, when Ballas comes out, you know, a lot of it's going to be Ballas. Yeah. It's so interesting that this entity told him how she had influenced him and that it was present in many of his novels because there's a story. Um, uh, in preparation, again, just reading parts of his life, one of his books, oh, which was it? Let me see if I can pull it up right now. Which was it? Uh, oh, the flow of my tears, the policeman said, I believe, uh, that the plot has to do with, um, a police officer, like running into a, a black man at a at a gas station or something. And so it later then he talks about how this event actually happened to him in real life. And then what's it, once it happened in real life, he had to help this black man at a gas station and the series of interactions unfolded as if the same way that he had written a book, uh, much earlier in time. And that then it gave him the revelation and it connected to, uh, the acts, of the apostles and again, Gnostic insight and all this different stuff. So, uh, so interesting. Again, it, it clearly seems like maybe he had a schizophrenic predisposition or he had some type of uh, mental potential uh, malady that, that left him more susceptible and more open to these experiences. Uh, who knows exactly what it is, but um, uh, very interesting that it had been with him throughout his entire life. That's what he later revealed when he was a child in high school in the 60s. And then this major event in 1974 from, from February through March of 1974 that gave him all this different insight. I'm less reticent about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is five. We're talking about five years and we're talking about an entity which had spoken to me in high school in the 60s and who also has saturated my writing with, with uh, pre-Socratic philosophy. I remember in 74 I was being interviewed 
uh, by a French guy who was doing his dissertation for the French PhD. And he asked me about the Empedoclean philosophy in the Ubik, and I said I had never read Empedocles, and he got so angry that he, although he'd flown all the way from France to interview me, he got up and left. He said, you're a liar. He said, you've got whole sections of Empedocles. And I later read, read Empedocles, and he was correct. But she was an authority on, on Greek philosophy. That was her speciality. She loved that, all the, the uh, Heraclitus and uh, Xenophanes and Parmenides. She loved the paradoxes of Zeno, but she disapproved of his arguing at any point. She disapproved of the sophists. She highly disapproved of the sophists. But she showed me the Sibylline books. They were really something. In the Sibylline books was listed the entire history of human civilization. She didn't show me all of my God. <laughs> she just showed me passages here and there. I have more than I can cope with. Oh dear. <laughs> I've wrecked your whole trip to Calvin. No, no, no. You've enriched it. Oh, she told me what was damaging the, the people's brains up there on the, on the drug, uh, mercury. She does tra traces of mercury. Where? Where do you? Uh, in the Bay Area. Remember the what Bay I said? Area. Yeah. The, yeah. This brain dysfunction. She yeah. said it was mercury. It was bichloride of mercury. She specifically said bichloride. And by the way, I didn't know that bichloride was bichloride of mercury. She just said bichloride. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I found out later that it was bichloride of mercury. Yeah. And she also referred to mercury orally taken later. Specifically, she said aspirin of mercury. She was always very cryptic. She forced me to go to reference books. But aspirin of mercury would be mercury taken orally, she said, as a medicine, as, as a pill. Trace amounts of heavy metals in the drugs that were being yeah. distributed in the streets. Yeah. 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 What else is in the drug? Well, you know, Burroughs' theory is that junkies are really addicts of heavy metal. Really? The, the thing they're looking for on the heroin, the body is searching for is heavy metal. That's that's the real addictive part of it. But, yeah, that's William Burroughs' theory. Right. I'm, I'm going to turn this thing up. All right, that is uh, that is the video again of Philip K. Dick talking about this entity, which is the basis for the book Valus, and then is a uh, progenitor to really a lot of really all the books that he writes for the rest of his life until he passes away in 1982. So. Again, very, very interesting stuff. Uh, this is a rare audio. Again, a lot of people haven't heard of it. I remember finding it years ago and then making the video that we just watched. Um, and so <laughs> uh, Meta Ninja says, the fact that you had to listen to this interview more than once in your life. Appreciate your service and sacrifice. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now, I, I, I am going to wrap this up here in a few, but there is also something else that I want to show you guys, and that is him talking about, again, using sort of divination for some of his books. So here is a clip. Um, again, he, this is from a video I made a long time ago called the, uh, Philip K. Dick, The Dark Side of Writing Science Fiction. And he talks about the, uh, uh, which book was it? Um, uh, the man in the high castle, the man in the high castle that when he wrote that book, he was literally casting, um, hexagrams again, look up the I Ching. It's a form of ancient Chinese divination. The I Ching was believed to, uh, give these ancient Chinese magicians and alchemists insight into the nature of time. And so the I Ching, there's supposed to be two books. Uh, again, only one book exists now. And this has been, so then the I Ching has been the basis for a lot of different speculative theories, including Terrence McKenna's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Terrence McKenna's uh, time wave zero theory, where he believed that under the mushroom, that getting high on psychedelic mushrooms, that the voice that he would hear on mushrooms 
told him to begin to reformulate these hexagrams that were part of book two, which we don't have anymore. And so he felt that he then built up book two. And then by doing that, he had this sort of code to the entirety of human history from beginning to the end. And this is part of his time wave zero theory. Uh, so interesting that then Philip K. Dick is also using the I Ching and divinatory methods that then contact, as you'll hear here, uh, what appears to be Lucifer, Satan, or you mean the entity self identifies as that. So the only reason I bring this up is that Philip K. Dick, uh, this Valus, this, this Pista Sophia, this Gnostic female voice, isn't the only thing that he contacted. He actually did divinatory practices to contact other entities. And so check this out. And in fact, just because it's kind of slow, I'm going to speed up the audio to 1.25. So if it sounds like he's speaking much faster, I I'm I'm going to speed up the audio here just for just for listener's sake. So, uh check this out. Again, very interesting stuff in regards to Philip K Dick. Fascism is very much with us today, boys and girls. He said fascism is very much alive and with us today, boys and girls. This one may be harder to hear, so let me know how the audio is. It's still an enemy. I wrote man high castle with him. You did. Yeah. I mean, I've been sorry ever since. Because when it came time to resolve the novel at the end, the Yi Ching didn't know what to do. I mean, it got me through most of the book. Every time they cast a hexagram, I actually cast four of them and got something and assigned it to them, and they proceeded on the basis of the advice given. Like when Juliana Frank decides to tell Abbotson that, that he's about to be off by, by a Zisher Heights Dean's agent, um, I threw the coins and she got, you know, warning, make known the truth of the court of the king, great danger, and so on. Uh, someone comes up behind him and hits him with a club. That's what she got. And so that's, she did go warn Evanson. If she got another hexagram, I would not have her go speak to Evanson. But then when it came time to close down the novel, Yi Jing had, uh, had no more to say. So there's no real ending on it. I like to regard it as an open ending. You see, it will segue into a sequel sometime. When you find somebody who's starting to write one. Yeah. Or if Yi Jing ever gets off its ass. Do you go back from time to time and throw it to see if there is an ending to it? or No, I don't use Yijing anymore. I'll tell you, Yijing told me more lies than, than anybody else I've ever known. Yijing has a personality. It's very devious and very treacherous. And it feeds you just what you want to hear. And it's, it's, really, it's really spaced out and burned out more people than that I would care to name. You know, like... It'll, it, you know, like, a friend is somebody who it doesn't tell you what you want to hear. A friend tells you what's true. Really, you know, a, a toady is the old word for somebody who told you what you want to hear. The kings all had their toadies around them, you know, who told them what they want to hear. The king said, am I the greatest king in the world? Yeah, you're the greatest king in the world, yeah. Well, that's what the Yijing does. It tells you what you want to hear, and it's not a true friend. One time, I really zapped it. I asked it if it was the devil, and it said, yeah. And then I asked if it spoke for God and said, no. It said, I am a complete liar. I mean, that was, in other words, I, I set it up. I, I, I set it up. I have two questions simultaneously. And it, it said, I, I speak with forked tongue, is what it said. And then it said, oops, I didn't mean to say that. But it had already Then you get it. a paradox. Oh, I, I watched a girl do this to a woman. I mean, that's the paradox. So, it's so it's it's lying when it says it's lying. Oh, uh, I, it's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just full of, it's a crock, is what it is. <laughs> Slotik, Slotik, John Slotik said this in his debunking book, you know. It's got some, he covers everything from Scientology to, to the Mafia. He says that none of them exist. And he says the Yijing, you know, Slotik did a parody of my writing, you know. Um, <laughs> it's as much better than anything I've ever done. Have you read Slotik's parody of my writing? Chip Dick K. Kill. Oh, yes, yes. It's it so much boy. better than anything that I can do. And I walked around, and I was really off the ground, walking on cloud nine after I read the parody. And I wrote Ed Furman, who was editor of FNSF. Those appeared originally in FNSF. And I said, I have talent. Slavik has genius. And Ed Furman wrote back and said, fine, I'm going to buy a lot of stuff from Slavik now. <laughs> and he did. He did. He commissioned eight more uh, parodies. And they're all marvelous. You know, parody of Asimov. Slavik said I was the hardest person to parody. I have his book in front of me now. In England, it's called The Steam Driven Boy and Other Strangers. Slavik says the easy is a hoax, and Slavik is right. His parody on me is called Solar Shoe Salesman. And uh, 
and then somebody consults these tiles, and it gives him many small, many small greatnesses deny. No same. <laughs> it does not further to discover gifts only. The wise king avoids fried food. And I says, "Oh, Slotty, you, you, you finished it off, man. I can never consult the EJ again." And I'll start laughing. <laughs> I'm looking at this parody and I'm saying, you know, if I could write as well as Claude. So that's another thing that brought me back into writing science fiction when I started to talk about being a mainstream writer, you know. We, we're, you know, we're using science fiction as a crash pad rather than a legitimate yeah. um, dwelling, you know. And I won't do that. I'll, if, if science fiction is going to go down the tubes, I'll go down the tubes with it rather than abandon it. I think it's unfair. You, you know, if you start thinking you're any good, you leave it. It's un, it's unfair to the field, and also it's so it's 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 it's, it's so like you know hubris, right? I am a great writer, you know. Therefore, I am not a science fiction writer. Well, how about your your first proposition? Maybe you're not such a great writer after all. Maybe you're wrong right there before you've even gotten to the second part of the proposition. Maybe a month ago, I was talking. Had Richard Lupoff on the show. Richard Lupoff, good writer, good competent writer, uh, probably best known for what he did for again, Dangerous Visions, uh, Little Old New Alabama, Benson Boomer Boys, uh, Little Old New Alabama, marvelous story. What? Watch her pretty too. Uh, yeah. Had Lupoff tried to pick her up in a bar. Didn't know it was his wife. <laughs> Most amazing thing happened. Found myself out in a parking lot, stretched out flat. Lupoff sure is a short fuse. All right, we're going to end it there, guys. Uh, Please smash that like. Uh, Truly appreciate it. I'm going to read some super chats. So if you guys would uh, like to support Church of the Eternal Logos, please do so using the Streamlabs link. I would greatly appreciate it, unless you prefer using YouTube or also for our uh, our people over on uh rockfin our rockfin members so uh feel free to throw in a super chat and i'm going to read those now again really interesting stuff uh it's kind of hard to hear these old audios but uh philip k dick again one of the most famous prolific uh science fiction writers of all time was clearly having uh, interactions with some uh, strange entities, no doubt. And so when we look at his books and we look at these sort of dystopian novels about technocracy, about fascism, about um, nuclear war, and then we look at the state of the world, these pre- this pre-less experience, these demonic activities, these, these forms of possession, is, is it prophetic? Was these demons actually infusing things into his into his books that were actually going to sort of manifest themselves later in history? I don't know. All right. Again, let me know what you guys think about that. But it certainly is interesting, nonetheless, that he had this really strange experience with the female Gnostic, uh, you know, Valus entity. He claims that he contacted an entity that said it was Lucifer, the devil, and it, it was the father of lies and that it spoke with a forked tongue. Interesting. Very interesting stuff. So, uh, again, and, and I'm not, I know that many of you guys may have seen and watched, um, I mean, uh, or read rather, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, I know that many of you guys probably read some of Philip K. Dick's books. And he, that's what I was talking about, even with um, things like, do androids, uh, do androids dream of electric sheep? That the, the idea of these, uh, these robots, these um, Nexus 6 model androids that the main uh, protagonist has to destroy in in the sort of uh, response against life, how they kill animals, how they kill, they they have no empathy. In a way, that's almost prefiguring the NPCs that we exist in now. So it's so weird. Like, again, it's, it's so strange that maybe this whole fascination with alternate timelines and, and everything happening at the same point is not that P- Philip K. Dick is this early Christian convert named Thomas that's being persecuted by the Roman Empire, which he believed was happening, uh, that, that he was both entities at the same time. But it's this preless. It's that these demons, these demonic activities, spirits, where, where is that realm? 
And of course, we engage with it according to Orthodox theology in the mind, the logismi, and that we, we, the battleground is in your mind. And so how strange that these books, uh, have aspects that seem to be kind of true uh, regarding uh, the, the world that we live in now. But, uh, yeah, cert certainly very interesting stuff. Um, so, guys, smash that like. I'm going to read some super chats. If anybody would like to throw a super chat in, please do so. Uh, I would greatly appreciate that. First super chat comes from Meta Ninjas. He throws in $5 and says, what is the orthodox interpretation of sleep paralysis and seeing slash interacting with demons during sleep paralysis? Well, Meta Ninja, um, I must confess, I've never actually had sleep paralysis. I know I've talked to actually fellow orthodox people that have had this experience, so it's more prevalent than you know, many would suspect, or at least I suspected. I didn't realize. Again, I've never had sleep paralysis, so I didn't realize how many people are actually uh, dealing with this issue. For those of you who don't know, sleep paralysis, from my understanding, is this sort of strange experience where people kind of wake up, but at the same time, they can't move their body. They're sort of trapped inside their body, yet their awareness is present, and they tend to see an entity in front of them, uh, usually some dark shadow, uh, what, sometimes it's moving around, sometimes it's trying to touch them or one thing or another. Um, I would definitely, if you're having problems with sleep paralysis, uh, I, 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 just as orthodox, there'd be a few suggestions that I would initially go with, but again, who am I? I have no idea. Uh, so you, you do what you feel is correct. I would one try to get the house blessed. Again, if you are Orthodox, uh, Meta Ninja, I know this is difficult if you're still getting into it or you're converting, but typically every year priests will do house blessings or you can ask your priest to do a house blessing. I would definitely try to cleanse the space. I would talk to your priest about, um, burning incense or getting holy water or different things that you may use as tools to try to cleanse that space. Also, cleanse yourself. Um, I have no idea. Again, I have no idea. I've never had sleep paralysis, but I have no idea what may cause sleep paralysis, but maybe trying to purify oneself thinking. Of it, and so fasting, going through, um, you know, looking at your diet, uh, potentially being blessed by a priest, uh, maybe wearing a cross. I don't know. Uh, praying regularly. If you're, you know, I'd be, cu I'd be curious. And if somebody's having sleep paralysis and, and have, have done these things before, please let me know. S talk about it in the chat. I'd be very curious. Um, you know, um, yeah. So we have multiple people. I've had sleep paralysis as Ralph Benjamin. Uh, I saw an angel of light around 2011, waking up from sleep paralysis as Kyle, uh, uh, Thomas Henderson says, I had an experience of it as a teenager. Terrifying. Uh, so so it look, sounds like multiple ple uh, former ghosts. She says, I've had sleep paralysis too in a time when I was living uh, like the prodigal son and I was extremely stressed for a long time at that time. And that would make sense theologically. Again, I've never experienced it, so I cannot say from personal experience I'd be, you know, maybe I would search the internet. Maybe there's some articles. Definitely talk to a priest. Definitely talk to clergy about that. Um, but I would suspect that that the th activities we're participating in are probably gateways or openings for those types of experience. As former ghost said, at that time I was living like the prodigal son. So what type of imageries you're, are you putting in your mind? What type of ideas? What what activities are you engaging in? Is your life, quote unquote, more uh, sinful than maybe you would like for it to be? I think sleep paralysis, um, you know, again, who knows? I've never experienced it. I'm familiar with people having it. But uh, but I would certainly question some of those things and maybe trying to address them may affect uh, the frequency you're having sleep paralysis. But um, also maybe getting an icon. I as Orthodox, I would I, I would highly recommend. Again, these are venerative windows, but I would highly recommend, you know, maybe getting an icon of Christ and putting it in your bedroom, putting it over your bed, putting it in a place where Christ can look over you. 
Um, I I would say that would potentially also be an option. Get and get the icon blessed. Take it to church. Get it blessed with holy water, and then put it in your room. I I think that would definitely potentially potentially I have no idea potentially work. Um, it seems like the sleep paralysis probably is more spiritual than just a sort of psychological phenomenon. Um, I know that commonly it's a psychological description, it's a psychological phenomenon, and that I, I've heard of people uh, like uh, through their own will eventually breaking out of the paralysis and being able to move their body. So uh, I, if I were you, again, and who am I? Who am I? If I were you, I would try to make sure you're praying before you go to bed. I would put an icon in your bedroom. That'd be the easiest way to try to begin cleansing that space. Obviously, having a priest come bless it with holy water may be difficult. I don't know your relationship to a parish or a priest, but you can always get a you can always get an icon, and you can get that icon blessed, and you can put it in your bedroom to watch over you. Um, you could also wear a cross. You know, any any uh, Christian who's uh, been baptized in the Orthodox Church, you get a baptism cross or a chrismation cross. And, uh, and you're supposed to wear, I wear mine every day. I always have mine on, uh, and mine's been blessed with holy water. Maybe that would be an option. Um, so that's where I would begin is really try to focus on your spiritual life and maybe purifying things where you can and see, and see where that takes you. Um, you know, also talk to clergy, talk to a priest, talk to a bishop, talk to an abbot, talk to a monk. Talk to somebody. They would maybe have dealt with this previously and have better experience than I have. Again, I'm sorry. I've never had sleep paralysis. I'm not. Now that I say that, I'll probably have it tonight. Um, uh, yeah, Thomas Henderson says, says, cross your doorway. That would all, you know, just try to cleanse your space. Because the thing is, 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 is spiritual entities are all around us. You know, we are existing. You and I are, are sort of limited in space and time, but at the same time, we're not limited to that dimension. We're open to uh, much more expansive dimensions, and entities are all around us. Um, when you go to liturgy, you know, how many angels and archangels are, are there with us? So I would try to think about it spiritually, and maybe there's activities that you're participating in that are opening you up to potential dark forces. I know I've heard it multiple experiences of people that were into astral projecting, uh, basically by doing that, they opened up a doorway and where they had very bad experiences in their bedroom. Um, and it, it began to kind of, uh, you know, for lack of a better description, sort of haunt that space in their bedroom. And so maybe, maybe thinking of it that way is, is, is there any potential activity you may or may, and again, I don't know, so I don't mean to put that on anybody. Again, I don't know who Meta Ninjas is, but thanks for your support. Um, that might be one way. Cleanse the space, get an icon, maybe wear a cross, get it all blessed, and pray. And then see see how that affects anything. See if that affects anything. So thank you very much, Meta Ninjas, for the support, brother or sister. I assume you're a brother. <laughs> Meta Ninjas, I really appreciate it. Um, and you, you, you've been a, you've been a strong supporter of the last few streams. So thank you very, very much, brother. And God bless you. Uh, if you give us, not that you, you may not want to, but if you do want us put in your, your first name or your Christian name, and certainly we can pray for you, that might be another uh, beneficial approach. So thank you very much, Meta Ninja, for the super chat. Next super chat comes from Taylor Stanley, and I got to say special thank you to Taylor Stanley. He has been a very generous, very generous supporter, uh, and he donates $50, $50 by Taylor Stanley. Thank you so much, brother. $50 super chat. He says, I used to buy LSD 100 hits at a time. Woo! There you go. <laughs> that, that, would, uh, that would certainly last most people for a while. Uh, he says, people thought I went nuts. Now I have a family and successful career. Thanks to God. Glory to God. No doubt about that. I think the spiritual experiences are real, but without God's protection, it's equivalent to thrusting a baby into a war zone. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and, you know, and this has come up multiple times. I recently did a stream over on the crucible with uh, father deacon, Dr. Ananias, um, I, I may go ahead and post it on uh, on this YouTube channel, but we di we discussed that um, 
um, the demonic and I brought up psychedelics and stuff like that. And one of the, one of the listeners was, un, you know, asking about, well, when would psychedelics be useful? And, and I recognize that, um, you know, the, the clinical studies with psilocybin and with MDMA and some of the stuff that's going on with PTSD, but, I believe, again, as Orthodox Christians, the warfare, the spiritual battleground is in your mind. And when you're dealing with psychedelics, literally mind manifesting based on the term that Humphrey Osmond came up, you're opening your mind, you're opening that battlefield up to, uh, it, you know, up to entities that could enter, that could influence you in ways that you probably never dreamed of or thought were possible. And I, and I look back, probably like Taylor, again, 100 hits of acid. Um, I did a lot of acid back in the day. And I look back now as an Orthodox Christian, not engaged in that stuff, and think, oh, my gosh. I know people. I look back at some of the people that I was friends with back then, and they still are doing some of that stuff. They're in the same place. Their life is not, you know, in my opinion, better uh, you look at the sort of scarification. We've talked about the attack on aesthetics. Um, it, it's like so <laughs> seeing the, the larger plan that's happening on the planet, uh, their politics. It seems like so many things have moved people in the opposite direction that I've moved in. And, you know, I, I feel like obviously as like many of you and certainly like Taylor Stanley that, uh, there is objective truth trying to figure out what that objective truth is, is part of this journey. I firmly believe, and I just did a one-on-one -on -one, shout out to Prescott. Hope, hope you're doing well, brother. That, um, that one of the commonalities with so many people I've talked to that get into this orthodoxy stuff is the, the sincere pursuit of truth. Like you're genuinely looking to, for what is true and that leads into conspiracy theories. Again, I did the whole escaping the matrix, the rabbit holes, following the white rabbit, you know, that whole meme symbolism in the matrix that it ultimately leads you to Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ brings you out of the matrix because with the logos, with the logos theology, with the entire package that the Orthodox Christian church gives you in the person of Jesus Christ, it gives you everything that you need. It gives you an understanding of deification. It gives you an understanding of human nature. It gives you an understanding of the purpose of creation, of who God is. Uh, again, solves the one and the many. Uh, an, an energetic understanding of reality. Again, oh, I, I feel that vibe. Well, in orthodoxy, we're engaging with the vibes of God. These are the uncreated energies. That's how we're deified. That's how we come to know somebody. You know me through my energetic activity. You don't know the essence of me. You know my energies. And through my energies, you know my personhood. And that is how we know God. It's like orthodoxy begins to answer these things. But at the same time, we live in a postmodern world. You know, Philip K. Dix often referred to as a sort of postmodern author. And so postmodernism is this idea that, the you know, all paradigms have broken down. This is you know, uh, you know, Thomas Kuhn and the scientific revolutions and, and, and Quine and all these criticisms of logical positivism, it, it, what that was in, pra in the rise of pragmatism is, is the breakdown of paradigms. There is no overarching paradigm in the postmodern world we live in now. And so therefore we have to look at all paradigms. And according to all paradigms, which one do we find appropriate? Which one makes the most sense? And I don't know anybody who adopts this orthodox stuff that doesn't begin to see life coming together in a more harmonious way, but it's not easy. And in fact, everybody I've talked to who takes this orthodox stuff seriously, life actually gets harder. You get, uh, you get, it, it becomes more difficult. You get attacked spiritually. It's not easy. But at the same time, life sort of comes together. And when you look back at the people still doing the drugs, still going to Burning Man, still participating in all that stuff, you know, again, who am I to judge? But uh, I just feel like it, it sets you on to do different paths. And, and then it does, as my academic research and diving into all the Gnosticism and the Mithraism and the drugs and seeing how all that stuff begins to connect and that there is these sort of parallel paradigms. That these sort of orthodox religions, now again, I believe orthodox Christianity to be the only true religion, but 
Orthodox Islam had to stamp out the use of drugs by the various Sufic mystics. Uh, uh, you know, Orthodox Zoroastrianism trying to stamp out all these Mithraic cults. Orthodox Christianity trying to stamp out all these Gnostic cults. And and there's like these they're like similar paradigms. And there's like the left-handed paradigm and the right-handed paradigm. And uh, when you begin to look at everything, it's like, wow, look, look at the patterns. Look where it leads people. Look where, look where their lives end. And I'm like Taylor. It's like, I, I want a family. I want children. I want safety. I want, I want true knowledge. No matter what that be, no matter what I have to change about myself, I want to know what is real. I want to do better. And I want to commune and have and, and, and be blessed. And I hope that the true living God, the Holy Trinity, has mercy on me. And hopefully, if I, again, it, it, through his will, that I could be a tool and a conduit for him into the world. Um, but even though I say all that, life doesn't get easier. It gets more difficult. You're going to be attacked. Orthodoxy is not easy. And that's probably why it's true. So... Anyway, sorry I'm going on a rant there, but Taylor Stanley, thank you so much, brother, for the $50 super chat. And again, he says, I used to buy LSD 100 hits at a time. That is a serious, that's a serious amount. Uh, that get, that get a few people high for sure. Uh, people thought I went nuts. You know, and, and people thought I was nuts too. And I probably was nuts, actually. Um, but as we move closer to God, we, we kind of regain our sanity and so he says, now I have a family and a successful career, thanks to God. Glory be to God. I think the spiritual experiences are real. They absolutely are real. The experiences that you have on psychedelics are real. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so I'm totally with you there. And um, in the pre-last, again, I did, a, I did a video over on, for members only, over on my YouTube channel, talking about my own psychedelic pre-last and, and two specific experiences of, of like serious spiritual delusion. Meanwhile, become a member. If you, if you would like to watch any of that content, definitely please become a website member for $5 a month. I'd greatly appreciate that. Um, but uh, yeah, I totally agree with... Uh, Taylor Stanley. Glory be to God, brother, and God bless your family. Thank you so much for the support. He says, I think the spiritual experiences are real, but without God's protection, it's equivalent to thrusting a baby into a war zone, and isn't that the truth? So thank you so much, Taylor Stanley, and again, God bless your family. Hope you're staying safe, and uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with your super chat, brother. I really couldn't. Uh, sounds like we have very parallel experiences, the use of drugs, getting high, um, and going into those altered states in pursuit of Gnostic wisdom, uh, you know, spiritual knowledge. We are very lucky that the Lord protected us. So thank you very much, brother. Uh, next super chat comes from Meta Ninjas. Throws in another super chat. Thank you very much, Meta Ninjas. Again, God bless you, brother. Hope you do well uh, with with the uh, with the. Uh, sleep paralysis. He says the fact that you had to listen to this interview more than once in your life. Appreciate your service and sacrifice. So thank you so much, Meta Ninja. I really appreciate it, brother. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, your support, brother. You've been very supportive over the last few streams. Thank you very, very much. And uh, and last super chat uh, comes from Jared Fetzer. Says it seems that he is influenced by the fallen angels. Seems in. Uh, Seems informed but confused. Also, the fallen angels are very proud and can't can't seem but to help boast about their plans for the demise of humanity. What do you think about that? Yeah, I absolutely think that. I, I think that based on his experience of uh, you know the, the entity telling him that his son had had an illness that they he, they needed to take the son to the hospital. It turned out he had an illness. Uh, that it talked about uh, finding different things in different places that he didn't know existed, uh, telling him to write certain things to certain people and that certain things would happen, and they did. That I absolutely think he was probably in contact with some type of, uh, you know, multidimensional entity, a demon, a demon, a fallen angel, exactly. No, I, I personally do believe that to be the case, and it makes sense then why it's like not totally true, but there's pieces of truth, and the whole thing is Gnostic, even though it's wrapped up in the, you know, the the Constitution and finding off the fascist New World Order and all this stuff. 
yeah, it, the entity was talking to him about all that stuff. But at the same time, it, <laughs> it, it, it seems like it, uh, it also led him astray and, it, you know, and God bless him. I, I, you know, I hope the Lord has mercy on, on Philip K. Dick. Um, it seemed like he was very curious. Uh, it seemed like, you know, again, uh, after the 1974, he talked a lot about Jesus Christ and wanted to learn more about Jesus Christ. But then he was friends with, uh, James Pike, the, the, the leftist Episcopalian priest who died, you know, uh, in, in Qumran looking at, uh, in the same place of the Dead Sea Scrolls fell off a cliff. So who knows? But, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you, Jared Fetzer. And again, God bless you and your family, brother. I really appreciate all the support. Jared Fetzer is a good, good friend of the program. Thank you very much, Jared Fetzer. He says, it seems that he is influenced by the fallen angels. Seems informed, but confused. And I couldn't agree more because, again, rationality, logic, all these things are energies of God. So you have to commune with the true God to receive these things in their fullness. Uh, but also the fallen angels were very proud and can't seem but to help boast about their plans for the demise of humanity. What do you think about that? I, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with your with your super chat, uh, Jared. So thank you so much, brother. Again, God bless your beautiful family. I hope everybody's doing well. And let me just check over on the rock. Uh, yeah, nobody, nobody, no super chats over on Rockfin. Uh, I see that there's five people over there. Shout out to you guys. Uh, thanks for being part of the program over on Rockfin. And so that looks like that's going to conclude tonight's stream. Guys, please smash that like. I would greatly appreciate that. Smash that like if you guys can. Um, I'm going to bounce out of here. Uh, I'll be back Sunday with a new stream that I think is going to be pretty interesting. I, I'm not totally positive that I'm going to what I'm going to stream on, but um, I think I have an idea. So if you have any suggestions, I know some people, some of you guys have really good uh, stream suggestions. Let me know. Leave it out in the in the comment section. Throw it. Uh, th message me, do whatever. I'd love to hear some of your guys' suggestions for streams. I'll be back Sunday and then I will be gone Tuesday to Tuesday of next week to the following Wednesday. I'll be in California visiting, uh, visiting somebody special, my girlfriend. So I'll be in California for a week. Uh, pray for me. Uh, certainly, uh, <laughs> not the most ideal place to be in the world. But it should be nice weather, and, and we'll have a good time for sure. So uh, not going to get a whole lot. So you're probably going to get a full week without content. I may try to make a few things to post while I'm gone. But uh, but I'm definitely going to stream Sunday, and I may stream again uh, Monday. But uh, I'll be leaving early Tuesday morning. So, guys, I really appreciate all the support. Again, special thank you to Jared Fetzer. Special thank you to Meta Ninja. And a very, very special thank you to Taylor Stanley and all the support that you've given me, brother. Really appreciate it. God bless you and your family. And hope you guys are doing well. And so until that, um, I will see you guys next time. And that should be Sunday evening. I will see you guys then. Make sure to look out for the chat, I mean, for the stream, and I will see you guys in the chat.